Well, we're continuing a series today called The Art of Neighboring, but I, to start out, I, I just want to ask this question. You know, what is most important to you? Okay, so, so I, I want you to just, just think about that for a minute. If you were going to list three most important things to you, you know, what, what would you say if, if someone asked you that? Now, my guess, let, let, let me guess what, what some of them would be, and, and if I forget others, you can tell me. Some of you would probably say something around your faith, right? God, faith. Uh, you may say family, and that may be your kids, your spouse, or family, uh, relationships. Some of you may say the work that you do. Um, wh- what else? Wh- what are some other things that come to mind as you think about like the first top two or three things that are most important to you? Health. health. There you go. Health. That's good. Yeah. Anything else come to mind? That uh, Maybe there's a hobby or something you're passionate about that you do in your free time that you really enjoy? Freedom, friends, there you go, yeah, yeah. And you guys, you guys are good, right? You guys gave all the, good, all the right answers. Like those are the answers you're supposed to give, right? And, and it's good, and those are, those, those are the aspirational things that, that we would want to say and that we want to believe are, are most important to us. Now, it, there's other ways to determine this. And I would suggest there's actually more effective ways to determine this. For example, if, we did, if I didn't ask you the question, but I looked at your bank account, and I looked at how you spent your money, what you spend your money on is, is an expression of what is most important to you. Does that align with kind of the aspirational things that you want to say are most important to you? Or if, if we looked at the media you consume, right, the things you watch, the articles you read, the, the podcasts you listen to, the, the books you read, the, the TV shows, the types of movies, you know, your social media content, like what they're feeding up to you, the ads they show to you, the, there's a reason they show those things to you because they know you care about those things. Does that align with what you say is most important to you? Or how you respond in a crisis. When things aren't going well, when things fall apart, what do you turn to? You know, what do you look to? And then your time. If we did an audit of this last week or this last month and how you spent your time, or if we looked at your calendar and what's planned for the coming week, How you spend your time, it's a lot like your money. These are things that are are limited and valuable to you. How you spend your time and your money say something about what's most important to you. John Wimber said it this way. He said, show me where you spend your time, your money, and your energy, and I'll show you what you worship. It's a good good way to think about this, and it's kind of convicting Because I don't know about you, but when I go through this exercise and I think about how I spend my time, my money, my energy, I'll be honest, it doesn't line up with the things I would say are the top two or three or four things that are most important to me. And I'm guessing for many of us that's, that's true. So in this series we're going through called The Art of Neighboring, we are asking the question, how do we, the second part of the greatest commandment, so Jesus said, someone came to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? He said to love God with everything you got. And the second part of that, though, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we're asking the question, what does it actually look like in a very practical way to love our neighbor as ourself? In the 21st century with the world and the craziness and, the, and technology and just the, the world we live in, how can we actually live this out? Is it possible? And when we're saying neighbor in this series, we're not just saying your neighbor as in everyone in the world or, or even your coworkers necessarily, but you're actually your literal neighbors, right? The, the people that actually physically live around you. If you're in an apartment, the people that live around you or if you live in a neighborhood. And so last week we gave out these, these, these magnets. And if you weren't here, you didn't get one. We have a few magnets left. I have them. You can come up and grab one after service. Um, on these magnets, so is, is a house in the center. That's you. And then we did an exercise, and we said, okay, those white boxes, the eight closest people that live around you. And we started off real simple. We said, do you know their names? And it was kind of convicting, wasn't it? I know Courtney and I did this, and we're like, oh, man, a couple of them we do, but a couple of them we don't. And so one of the challenges during this series, it's really hard to love someone if you don't know their name. And so we said, let's start out simple. and Let's let's take these, put this on our refrigerator as a reminder that over the coming weeks, let's at least learn the names of the people that live around us. And then you got bonus points if you knew their last name, and you got bonus points if you knew something about them. Now, I don't know about you, but when you look at this, and it's like, okay, man, eight people, maybe eight new relationships that I don't really spend much time on now, 
it seems a little overwhelming. And I don't know if anyone thought this, but how am I in the world am I going to have time for more people and more relationships? One of the barriers, I would suggest, to loving our neighbors well, to loving our neighbors as ourselves, is the time it takes to do that. I'm guessing there is no one here that says, you know what, Scott, I have so much free time. I just, I'm sitting around all the time thinking, like, what should I do with my time? Right? No one, no one thinks that. None of us live that way. That's not the world that we live in, which is kind of interesting. So just, just imagine. Let, let's pretend it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago, right? And let's say, you know what? In the future, you're going to be able to receive mail anywhere you are. Anywhere in the world, you, you, can get a, you can get mail, and you can send mail. You can get a message. You can send a message. You can make a phone call anytime. You'll be able to do work from anywhere. You won't have to be at the office. You can do work from home. You can do work while you're riding in the car, and you'll be connected, and you can do work. When you watch TV, you won't have to be home at 8 p.m. to watch that 8 o'clock show, but you'll be able to watch it anytime. It'll be called streaming. Right? The things you love, you can do anytime you want. And the best part of it, you won't have to watch any advertisements. <laughs> now, 20 or 30 years ago, if you were told that, my guess is that what you would have thought is, man, we are going to have so much time. Like, life is going to be so good. We're going to so, be so productive. We're, we're going to get so much done so fast. What are we going to do with all of our time? That's probably what you were thought. A lot of really smart people thought that. Actually, even further back than that, the, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, he said this, he said, and this was written in 1930, he said, in the 21st century, a 15-hour work week will suffice as we turn instead to how to use freedom from pressing economic cares. What he was saying was, because of technological advances, as I project out 100 years from now, that people probably will only need to work 15 hours a week. And instead, we'll be able to focus all of the rest of our time on, on freedom and on the things that we enjoy. 15-hour work weeks. How's that working for you? <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone living in this, this reality? No, I think the reality for many of us, even with all the productivity, even with all the tools and the technology, is that for many of us, instead of creating more space and margin, what's it done? It's crammed more and more into the time that we have. And instead of creating more freedom, we've become more enslaved and more overwhelmed, and more busy, and more stressed out, and more distracted. I mean, how many times do you think, man, if I just had another hour in the day? I mean, I see y'all posted a lot, right? People are like, man, if I just had a little bit more time. Now, part of the reason I think we struggle is there are some myths that we buy into, right? There's some lies that the enemy has fed to us that we've just accepted. And, and so, so, so a couple of these, so the someday myth, Someday, things will slow down. I remember as a parent, man, as a parent, man, I thought this every season of life, right? Like, once my kids get out of diapers, things are going to be so much better. We're going to have so much free time and, and money, right? <laughs> once my kids can dress themselves and brush their own teeth, once they learn how to drive, once they, you know, graduate and move out, once I get that new job, once we move closer to my work or to school, like, someday... Things will get so much better. I'll have more time. Things will be easier. And it's a lie. It's a myth. The reality is things will only settle down when one of two things happen. Number one, you become intentional. Or number two, you die. Right? There is not a season of life where suddenly you're going to get to a point, you're going to wake up one day, and then suddenly everything's going to be easy. And you're going to have lots of time. No, no. The only way we can get on top of this is if we're intentional. Another myth we buy into is the one more. The one more myth. I just need one more promotion. I just need one more bonus. I need one more raise. I, if I just get that next job, if, I, if we just get that car or that right house or I find that right person, right, I just need that one thing, then I'll be content. And then I'll be able to focus on things that really matter. And we spend our life chasing after things and circumstances and people and stuff and we never are satisfied. And the reality is, that if that's what we base our contentment on and our satisfaction and our joy and our happiness on, we'll always be chasing after it. No, we've got to find something that's eternal. We've got to find something that's unchanging. And I submit to you, I would suggest to you that there is no better thing and there is no other thing in this world that can meet those requirements other than Jesus. 
He is the only thing we can build our lives on and anchor ourselves to that will help us to be content. If not, we're always going to be chasing. That's part of the reason we're so busy and overwhelmed. Another myth is the everybody myth. The everybody myth says that, you know what? Everyone's overwhelmed. Everyone's busy. Everyone's stressed out. It's just how life is. The truth is, no, they're not. They don't all live that way. There's some of you in this room right now that do a really good job in this area. But what the media would tell you and what, what culture would tell you is this is just normal. And if that's the case, and be, don't be, we don't want to be normal, do we? It's a lie. People don't, life doesn't have to be this way. The work-life balance myth. So often people say, you know what, life is just like, it's like this teeter-totter. And if we can just get, get, do, do enough work, and we do enough family time, and we do enough, uh, you know, for my spouse and my kids, and I do enough uh, of my hobbies, it, it, and, and we achieve this perfect balance, then we will have arrived. How many of you have achieved that perfect work-life balance? And if you do, it's fleeting. It lasts for a moment. Why? Because the reality is that life ebbs and flows. There are seasons where you've got to give more to your work. There are seasons where your, your spouse or your kids need more from you, and you've got to give more to them. There are seasons where you pull back, and you can rest and, and, and have more leisure time and just disconnect. I think a better word to describe that is work-life flow. That's the truth of what we're after. But work-life flow doesn't happen unless we're intentional about it. You know who lived these out really well and, and didn't fall into any of these myths is Jesus. Like he was the perfect at all of these. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be hanging out in Luke. So last week we looked at the Good Samaritan. We're going to, we're going to pick up on a story right after that. And if you've been around church long or you're a Christian, or you, you probably know this story. It's about two sisters, Mary and Martha. So we're going to be in, in Luke here, Luke 10. I'm just going to read a few verses here from, from the story where Jesus shows up at their house. Just imagine for a minute, hey, Jesus is coming to your house this afternoon. Like, what would you do? How would you get ready for him? That's the situation Mary and Martha find themselves in. Check this out. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up and said to him, Lord, don't you care that Mary has left me to serve alone? She's doing nothing. She's making me do all the work. Tell her to come help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and distracted, or anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Martha has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person that you brought into this room or online today. Holy Spirit, I, what I know is that you have a very specific reason for us being here. And right now, Holy Spirit, we open our hearts and our minds to you, and we invite you to come into this place and have your way with us. God, I know many of us this morning, those words troubled, anxious, distracted, describe us. Holy Spirit, would you help block out the distractions? For those of us that need encouragement because our hearts are troubled or anxious, Lord, would you replace it with peace? And God, I pray not only that would you still our hearts, but that our minds would be open to the changes and, and how you want us to be intentional in living our lives to accomplish all that you've called us to and to love others well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's start with Martha. Martha is a good host. If I knew Jesus was coming to my house, I would want to do what Martha did. I would want to make sure the house is clean. You know, you go check the bathrooms and the table, right? You want it to be good. I would make sure that there's some good food because I know Jesus likes to eat and hang out with people and have fun right? And, and I'd prepare good food. And, and then when he's there, I'd, I'd want to make sure that his needs are being met and, and that I'd serve him and give him refills and, and more food if he wants more. And, and he's comfortable. And, and I'd, you know, help remove the plates and clean up like once he's done eating. And then we'd move to the couches and sit and talk. I don't know about you, but that's how I'd prepare for Jesus. And that's how I'd want to host him. And that's exactly what Martha did. 
And when I read that and I think about that, you, you, almost, you think that she would be commended for it, but actually the opposite is true. Jesus describes her as being distracted and anxious. Why? Because she's missing something that's even more important. She's doing a good host, but she's missing something else. I think the words I think about Mar- Martha is she, she was rushed, right? I like that word distracted. She was hurried, right? Think about those words, hurried, rushed. Maybe she was missing out. Does that describe how life kind of feels to you sometimes? The, the, when I think about those words, the situation I think about is a wedding. Now, I, I've been around lots of weddings. I, I, got, I was in one myself. I was a, a groomsman several times. I've officiated a bunch of weddings. And, and one of the things about weddings, like I always laugh at the, the um, brides that are super uber prepared. You know, they have like a, a notebook, right? They have a binder of stuff and, and months ahead, six, 12 months ahead, they're doing everything they can. And one of the things that uh, makes me laugh is no matter how well you prepare for your wedding ahead of time, the last two weeks are chaotic. And they're stressful and things are coming together and falling apart at the last minute. And then the wedding day, the wedding day happens. And the wedding day never goes exactly as it should. Like there's always small things that, that get missed or overlooked or, or don't turn out exactly as you hope. And, and, and one of the things I always count, counsel brides and grooms on is that you want to be careful because if, if, not, if you're not intentional, you'll end up at the end of the day and you'll look back and it'll be a blur. And you won't remember that. Maybe some of you like your wedding day, like it was just a blur. And, and, and you don't remember much of it, right? Um, and, and so what I always tell them, uh, the morning of, when, when I first, I, I usually meet with them individually the, the morning before the ceremony, is, is just don't worry about anything. Don't worry about any of the plans and what should happen. Because if things don't go right tomorrow, no one else is going to remember it. Next week, you're not even going to remember it. But think about and focus on what's really important. It's the commitments that you're going to make today, it's the covenant that you're entering into be- before God and these other people. That's what matters. That's what a year, 10 years, 20, 40 years from now is really going to matter. No one else is going to remember anything else, but it's the covenant and it's the commitments. That is the main thing. And, and when I think about Mary and Martha, Martha was missing the main thing, right? She, she, she was so hurried and she was so busy that she was missing what was truly important. She was hurried. And hurry is a great enemy in our spiritual lives. Hurry is maybe one of the greatest enemies in our spiritual growth and relationship. And here's why. Because Jesus said the greatest commandment, we talked about this last week, is to love God with everything you got. Your heart, your soul, your mind, strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Love and hurry are incompatible. You cannot love someone in a hurried state. Love requires time. John Ortberg says it this way. He says, love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time, and time is the one thing hurried people don't have. And so when you think about your relationship with God, when you think about your relationship with your spouse, when you think about your relationships with your friends or your kids or your neighbors, you can't love any of those people well when you're hurried. You know what it's like in the morning to do your devotional time. I was talking to someone right before church about this. To do your devotional time and to do it really quickly to check the box versus what it's like to to do your devotional time and to read God's word and just to spend time abiding. It's very different, isn't it? How does your spouse feel when when you're you're having a conversation with them but at the same time you're distracted because you're thinking about what you need to go do next? They know it, don't they? You're not loving them well in that moment. And we can't love our neighbors well. If we're, if we're hurried. And Martha was rushed. She was hurried. She was, she was distracted by some good things, but not what was the main thing. Because not every good thing is a God thing. Mary, on the other hand, how was Mary described? She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Mary got it. Mary understood. Now, Mary sitting at Jesus' feet was wrong in so many ways. Number one, Martha thought she should have been helping her. And so there's, she's disappointing her sister. Number two is, is, is Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher, a Jewish teacher. And you know who sat at the feet of rabbis? They're students. 
in this culture, in this time, you know who could be students of rabbis? Men. That's right, someone said it. Women were not allowed to be students of a rabbi. And so a woman should not be sitting at the feet of a rabbi. That was, that was taboo, and it violated so many cultural norms. But Mary didn't care. And what I love is Jesus didn't care. He's like, I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're a man. If you want to be around me, I will love you and accept you because that's who he is. Jesus was for women's rights hundreds of years before it was a progressive or a political topic of our political discourse, right? Jesus was the original one for equality. Like as Christians, that this is not a, a, a Republican or a Democratic idea. This is a Christian idea because this is what Jesus modeled. And he said, Mary, or I don't care if you're a woman. If you want to sit at my feet, come sit at my feet. And Martha, you should actually be sitting at my feet too. Like this is the way, this is the best thing right now. This is the best way to spend your time. It was not normal in their culture for women to do this. It is not normal. It, what is normal in our culture today is to be busy and hurried and distracted. It is not normal to be intentional with your time and to make hard decisions, to be willing to disappoint some, to say no to some good things, to say yes some, to some great things, and to be intentional with how we spend our time to love others well. So we call this the art of neighboring, and, and, and the, the, the word art is important because this isn't really a science. There's not five steps we're going to give you throughout this series to love your neighbor well. It looks different for you than it does for you than it does for you. Some of you live in apartments. Some of you live downtown. Some of you live in condos. Some of you live in neighborhoods. Your neighbors are different. You're different. You're, we all have different schedules, and life is just different, and that's okay. That's why we call it an art, right? There's some creativity to it, and, and there's some freedom and expression to it. There, this isn't a formula. And so when we think about our time and how we become are intentional with our time, I want to give you two arts for your time as well, because there's not a science to this. There's not three steps I'm going to give you today that's going to apply to all of you, because we're all in very different places in life. The first art when it comes to how do we get out of the busyness is the art of prioritization. The art of setting priorities. We said that we, if, if you want to know what's most important to someone, you, want, you look at their bank account, you look at how they spend their time. And so being intentional with setting priorities means that instead of reacting, we become proactive, right? Instead of just responding, we think ahead to how do I really want to spend my time? What does that look like? Jesus was phenomenal at this. I love this example here in, in, in Mark 3, 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed. So all these people follow him. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they would crush them. So here's what's happening, right? No one ever describes Jesus as being rushed. No one ever says Jesus should have done more, right? No one ever says Jesus was distracted. No, he was fully in the moment. And, and sometimes that would mean he was with his closest few, you know, the, those closest to him, his disciples. Other times it would mean that he was in front of a crowd preaching or feeding people and serving people. And then other times he would pull away and be by himself. But what I love here is there was this moment that was happening where he was going to be in front of a crowd and he was going to be ministering and speaking and sharing with them. But he wasn't just reacting to that. He was thinking ahead beyond that. He said, you know what? There's going to come a point where I'm going to need to step away from the crowd and we're going to need a way to get out of here, guys. Right? And so he has him pull up, get this boat ready. Why? Because he's being proactive. Because he knows that I can't just give in to what people expect around me. Now, I'm going to serve the crowd. I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to help them. I'm not going to ignore them or neglect them. I want to love them well, but at the same time, there's going to be a point where I'm going to pull away. But to do that well, I've got to prepare for that. I've got to be proactive. I'm in a season of life right now where my kids are teenagers. They're all in high school. And I've realized um, that this time I have with them is limited. In a couple years, they're going to be moving on to whatever is next. And so one of the things I've started trying to do is to be really intentional with how I spend time with them and trying to get more one-on-one -on -one time with them. And so a couple weeks ago, I took one of my daughters out for a, for a date night. And, and last night, I took two of my kids out because mom's gone with one of the other ones. And we went out and saw a movie and, and just spending one-on-one -on -one time with them. Because I don't want to fast forward three or four years from now and 
have regrets that I didn't do more of this. I want to be intentional. And so right now, I'm, I'm making them a priority, one-on-one connection with them a priority, where maybe, you know, in the past, I haven't done that as much. But if we want to be intentional with our time, if we want to love others well and not be hurried and just reacting, we've got to set priorities. The, the other art I want to share with you this morning is the art of elimination. Now, this is a hard one because this may mean you say no to some things. And it's hard for us to say no. Many of us don't want to disappoint others. There's this story um, at the Stanford Business School. There's an assignment that they give. And the assignment is this, is that tomorrow morning you're going to get two phone calls. One phone call is, is going to say, hey, you've been given $20 million. No strings attached. You're like, awesome. That's the phone call I want to have. And then right after you hang up, there's another phone call, and it's your doctor. And your doctor says that you've been diagnosed with a terminal incurable disease, and you have 10 years to live. So just put yourself in that situation, $20 million, 10 years to live. How would you live your life moving forward? What decisions would you make? What things would you stop doing? Jim Collins is a a business speaker and author. He says that most people, they don't need a better to-do list. What most of us need is a stop doing list. Are there things in your life, and I'm not talking about bad stuff, I mean, maybe there's some bad stuff, but I'm talking about good stuff that is in your life that is blocking out and, and, and keeping you from doing some great stuff. This is what the art of elimination is about. It's, it's giving up a good thing for a God thing. Are there some good things you're doing that maybe in this season, in this time, you need to press pause on because there's some God things that he's calling you to? If you've been around the church long, you know that we, um, every month we have a, a food pantry. And what you may not know is the food pantry has been going on for 16 years. We've helped over 10,000 people. Um, it's where the little food, there's a, a little food pantry out front now where people can get food anytime. Uh, we, we've, we've been on the news because of it. But what you may not know is the origin story of the food pantry. And I know it's really cool and popular right now to talk about origin stories of actors and superhero characters. And so I thought today, I, I just wanted to share the origin story. And so Darren and April Stover, where are you? There you are. Come on up here, guys. Yeah, you can clap for him. All right, Darren and April are the reason that the food pantry exists today. So, all right, so, so um, let's just, let's go back 16 years and talk about what made you want to help people with food. Like, like, take us back to that moment. Like, what was it about food specifically and, and helping people? Like, how'd you get there? Do you want the long version no, or the short no, version? No, let's do the short version. <laughs> the 60 seconds. If you guys know April, she has a really hard time talking, so <laughs> we could be here uh, an hour later. No, let, let's, do the, let's, let's do the 60 second version if, if, if we can. It began when we had a life group. We had a life group at our house, and um, we were challenged. We were studying, studying the book of Acts, and we had um, a lot of strong people in our group. We had a, a minister that was growing up, um, Mike Hooven. We were really deep into the word of Acts, and then you challenged us in our group to have an outreach to help our community, and that's when we decided to provide clothing and collect it, and our hearts knew that so many people needed that area filled for them they could get food and clothing for free from us and that was the way that's right it started with clothing wasn't it clothing was a big part um what you guys may not know 16 years ago the church was in a conference center actually just down the street and so we didn't have a building to store food store clothing so how did you guys i mean we didn't have a storage place like how did you guys start out um at that point in our lives, our kids were grown, our sons were grown, so our basement was empty, <laughs> and we were having our life group there, so we could just be intentional on every Tuesday at our life group, putting those clothes in our basement, and sorting them in totes, and just working and getting all of everybody to 
give us those things. And so we used our basement as the first pantry. And it worked out very well. It was a, it was a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. It was so you guys, I think about the cost, right? So you guys gave up space of your house. For, I remember the boxes, uh, right? The, the boxes, boxes and the clothing. Stuff. You guys, um, I, don't know, I mean, probably a lot of time, a lot of time. right? Mm-hmm. And people just drop stuff off. We'd have to go get it, take it to our yeah. house and yeah. sort it. And I remember we, we were a small church. I mean, we were like, we didn't have the resources we have now. And so I know there was, there was probably some financial, I mean, people rallied around, but mm-hmm. there was probably financial things. Well, the, eight t- the people that was in our life group, we bought totes and boxes. And so lots of people, lots of time, yeah. lots, lots of time. And, and um, lots of people that still here at our church now. (laughs) Is there a memory or a person that, as you think about, 16 years is a long time, like, as you think about, that stands out to you, like, just... If you go back to the very beginning, um, we had a gentleman from Nigeria that came in. Um, We had two ladies, uh, we called them the Karens, their first names were Karen. And they helped, his big problem was is he couldn't get enough time at the library to get signed up into college. And so he used the church's computers and got signed up into classes. And he graduated. Uh, and he came into the church and got a big bag of clothes and took him to Nigeria. He took three suitcases full of, ni- of clothes to Nigeria. And that was just a, a blessing to know that he was passing on what we had to people that were in real need. Wow, that's awesome. Um, I think as humans, it's hard to keep, do something over an extended period of time, right? We all set goals, and we, like a month later, <laughs> we're done with them. Um, but we start and stop a lot of stuff as humans. And then I think churches also, well, we, churches in general, not ch- our church specifically, but just in general, churches aren't great about doing something over a long period of time, and sometimes there's good reasons for that. But 16 years, you guys have been involved in the pantry. And I know Monica is, is where's Monica at? There's, where, there's Monica. Monica. Monica leads it today. Raise your hand, Monica. So anyone that has questions about the pantry after this, see Monica. Yeah. But you guys are still involved. What's kept you going? The love of Jesus, you know, and, and the, uh, the need in the community, uh, the people that, that help, uh, I see, look out here, and I see all kinds of people that have helped us out. Uh, we're blessed to have Monica and David take over. Uh, she does a great job with it, and we're so happy for her. Yeah. And she's, and she's doing this. But it's just, it's our calling. It's what God wants us to do, and so we just, we just keep doing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. We love the people that we've met. We have um, people that come to the pantry today. It was um, different then, and we gave that to God, and it changed, and mm-hmm. it's beautiful now. And we have people that still are coming today that were originally with us at the other church and all this time. And um, Ray, Metal Ray, um, still calls, and we still love him. And so the family that we have made and the, and the love that we've really seen Jesus change people and people come in that room and get along, nobody, we never had any conflicts We've always had love, and it was always about Jesus. And so yeah. that was what we try to be intentional about, letting people see Jesus really, yeah. really loves you. That's awesome. Um, in Hebrews 11, Paul talks about heroes of faith. And he names names like um, Moses and Joseph and Abraham. And, and I think what he talks about is not only did they have tremendous faith, but there was action behind it. And I'm confident if Paul was up here today and, you know, was thinking about the Midwest and central Indiana and heroes of faith, that Darren and April would be, would be in that list. And so um, I just want to honor you guys and say thank you. And they wouldn't be here today. So, all right. Love you guys. Thank you. Love you guys. The pantry wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Darren and April saying yes 16 years ago. 
And I wonder for your life, as you fast forward a few years, what God wants to exist that doesn't yet exist today. And it all started with him saying yes. What is it God's calling you to say yes to? And to say yes to something, it's probably going to require you to say no to some other things. And there's probably some good things that you might need to say no to, to say yes to the God thing. And if you don't know what that is, I can promise you, if you ask the question and you stand up and just say, yes, I'm here, send me God, what is it? He will show that to you. He will reveal it to you. What I can promise you is it probably involves relationships. Notice when they told their story, they didn't talk about the, the pieces of clothing or, 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 you know, it was all about people. And this is what loving our neighbors is all about. Let's be a people that are willing to say no, that are willing to set priorities and, and to eliminate some things to create space for what God has. Father, right now, we open our hearts and our minds to you. What is it that you want us to say yes to? What is it that you, as you look out five or 10 or 15 years, that, that's going to be in existence because we were willing to make it a priority? Father, help us not to live a life of regrets. We don't want to look back and say, man, we just got by. We were so busy. It was so chaotic. We were so hurried and rushed that we missed the main things. May we be a Mary and not a Martha. And so, Holy Spirit, we just give you this time, and as we move into worship and connecting with you in a deeper way, would you speak to us? Would you open our eyes and show us what you have in store and what you're calling us to? In Jesus' name, amen.